Howdy, and welcome to the show. Cooper's Code focuses on legal issues and noble practitioners, distilling wisdom so we all achieve the best results for our clients. I'm Miles Cooper. Thank you for joining us for this part three of our three-part series with Judge and Dean Jeffrey Brand. We keep getting close to it, and I keep then taking us down a different direction in terms of talking about your experience as a professor, then Dean at USF. And before we get there, it sounds like you were teaching at Lincoln all the, kind of all the way through as, as a practitioner as well. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's how I got the job teaching at Lincoln was because uh, they were just looking for somebody that was applying the rules of evidence kind of on a daily basis. And as a public defender, that's what happened. Um, but uh, it wasn't until 1986 that I stopped uh, doing any practice and then went full-time into teaching. What led to that decision? First of all, I, I love teaching. I found it exciting. I found the idea of educating future generations of lawyers um, inspiring. And I had fun with it. And I thought, actually, that I, I was pretty good at it in the sense that students responded and I felt like we could learn together. And so a position uh, opened up at USF. They were just starting uh, a course called uh, Lawyering Practice. It was an attempt to bring practical skills training to the curriculum, which... Uh, to this day remains less than it should be, although it's just eons beyond what it was in the 1980s. And uh, uh, they asked if I would uh, want to teach and help to create that course along with another colleague who became a lifelong friend. And um, I decided, yeah, it was time to do that. And... I, I want to say the rest was history. I had taught uh, as a visitor at USF 7980 or 8081. So I knew what it was like to be there full time. And uh, uh, I decided this was a great opportunity and I wasn't going to pass it up. So one of the things that, and I'm fast forwarding a bit on your involvement at USF, you went from being... A, a, a driver in the professor role to in, in the dean role, at least from the outside, um, driving an, an expansion and improvement of this school that seems unprecedented, at, at least from my awareness. What led to your, in essence, your drive in that regard? First of all, just as a precursor, and I, I, I feel this strongly, um, what I did built on what others did. I remember when we dedicated Kendrick Hall, the, uh, we had, uh, not everybody's familiar with USF, but originally there was Kendrick Hall given by the Kendrick family. That was the law school. And then uh, Dean J. Falberg uh, was primarily responsible for fundraising for uh, the library which became the Doreen Z. Flaw Library, just a beautiful building. And um, uh, I had the privilege of just kind of executing what Jay had done with the library. But at the same time, the original building had to be gutted. So uh, we ended up redoing all of the facilities. I just wanted to be clear that there were other deans and others who uh, deserve, you know, as much credit as anybody. And given that um, you were not dean fully while well, I was taking some finals, and I remember pile driving for the library going on during my finals. That's, that's right. I should I should give Dean Fulberg that credit. Yes, de definitely. Okay, but it, it, what drove me to teaching? And there were two things that drove me to teaching. One was I loved teaching. I had fun with teaching. We laughed a lot in class. Uh, and I found that the more fun the students were having, 
the more they wanted to learn. Uh, so I, it was just my uh, joy in 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 being a professor. That was that was one thing, but there was something special about USF, and that was that built on and was related to the Jesuit community that I first encountered when I had been working with Frank Newman. And I got to know the Jesuit community at USF and their commitment to uh, justice and their commitment to the common good uh, was astonishing. Uh, Steve Prevett, who was the president of the university most of the time that I was there and a very good friend now, the first time I, he ever came to the faculty, I was already dean. And he knew I was Jewish, and we did it. You know, I always joked about it. Uh, the the uh, uh, moniker for the uh, Jesuit community is, for example, Stephen Prevet S.J., which means uh, Society of Jesus. And my moniker, I always used to joke, was Jeff Brand S.J., still Jewish. <laughs> It got a laugh, but they, the point was that the Jesuit mission was extraordinary. And um, so Steve came to lunch with the, when he first became president, and I asked him an unscripted question uh, after he had given a little introductory talk to the faculty. I said, uh, Steve, from your perspective, what is the mission of a Jesuit law school. And he came back with this sentence, to train lawyers who hunger and thirst for justice. And I thought to myself, as as he was saying, and I thought, "Uh, this is unbelievable. A particular political agenda has nothing, or a particular political leaning has zero to do with this. As a matter of fact, Uh, In an educational context, once uh, somebody injects their own politics, uh, it becomes an indoctrination session, not a learning session. And it also ignores the fact that we need great lawyers who are concerned about the common good, who hunger and thirst for justice for their client in every context, the business context. The criminal context, the more civil rights, as we commonly use that phrase, context. So this was a universal mission focused on the common good. And uh, that's also what led me to become dean. Because I thought, my God, what a great way to wake up in the morning, to have the opportunity to tell people this is what we're about. And um, I love doing it for that reason. People always say to me, how could you fundraise like that for all those years? It was easy. It was something I believed in. And it was also, if people wanted to contribute, wonderful. And if people didn't want to contribute, fine. I understand. People have other priorities. People may not be interested in what I was talking about. But the idea that I was trying to raise money for an institution that was going to train lawyers, skilled ethical professionals, was worth the effort because it was so important as a pillar of society. And again, I, you know, maybe that all sounds trite, but um, I believed it deeply then. I still believe it today. I don't feel like it sounds trite. I think part of the reason why you were probably so effective in the role that you served is because it's evident, at least on this side of the table, how deeply you believe in what you do. I appreciate that. The other piece that I believe you were involved in in some expansion of, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, are some of the work, uh, the outreach work to other countries and and involvement in on kind of an international level. And Rather than have me muddle through a question, can you can you elaborate a little bit on on what your involvement was there and what drove you to do that? Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling uh, again because uh, I'm actually working on a book right now related to all of that. Um, 
And again, this was uh, not uh, uh, initially the driving force between be, for this was uh, a professor at the law school who I knew before I got to the law school, uh, Dolores Donovan. Uh, I mentioned her name specifically because she had this idea that it was important to bring uh, Cambodians in particular to the law school after the Khmer Rouge devastation and to help Cambodia rebuild its legal infrastructure. She had been there doing work there. And um, initially in 1994, I guess it was 93 that we got the grant, she wrote the first grant to bring five Cambodians to uh, USF. The uh, uh, USAID folks at that time, who had been roundly criticized for their not staying in their lane during the 60s and during the Vietnam War, uh, actually uh, were a group of people that understood the need to train lawyers, but not based on what our system necessarily was, but what their own needs were as they perceived it. And uh, this uh, started a series of grants and work that lasted at least 20 years. And uh, it, it was work that originally started in Cambodia where uh, we had our uh, uh, Cambodia Law and Democracy Program. Uh, we brought, I don't know, 30 Cambodians who had some legal education to USF to further that legal education. Uh, I was in and out of Cambodia two times a year, spending enormous amounts of time there. We created textbooks. We created law schools. We created a Cambodian legal education center that um, uh, was its charge was to provide basic legal education to people who might need it in the new uh uh, government structure that was developing. And we assisted other people who were there also doing interesting things, setting up a legal aid structure, setting up a bar association. So this went on for decades. And uh, it took various political turns that uh, have been difficult. Uh, the government in Cambodia now is... Uh, not the government that I think any of us envisioned at the time. The, there was initially a coalition government formed with the UN in 1993 that uh, imploded in 1997 in the middle of a coup, which uh, where I was with my students at the time that the fighting broke out. That's a, another story. Um, but nonetheless... I do think that we had a, a large impact in helping to resurrect a legal infrastructure for Cambodia that had been completely uh, decimated implies that something is left standing. Uh, I don't think decimated does it justice. Uh, it had been destroyed during the time of the Khmer Rouge. That program led to other things as well. So, for example, we did a judicial training with judges in Cambodia that uh, I really liked. And I, I, to this day, I think the materials really worked. It was a comparison of their legal system, our legal system, with case files based on their cases, not our cases, all translated in uh, using Khmer, their language, not our language. Um, and I went to a funder, it was actually the Dutch, and I said, you know, we ought to do this in Vietnam. Because at the time, the U.S. had not reengaged. It was just uh, beginning to. And I went knocking on doors there, ended up with the Minister of Justice, ended up, we did multiple uh, efforts in Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City, in Hanoi, uh, training judges, do, working with law schools, doing seminars in various topics. Again, all comparatives-based. 
did work in Indonesia, we did work in East Timor, uh, did some work in China. Uh, and so it was an extraordinary adjunct to my time as dean. Uh, eventually, we established the Center for Law and Global Justice. And uh, through that, many of the programs were managed. And USF had a rich history of uh, doing international human rights work. Um, another professor established uh, what I think was the first international human rights clinic, again, which Frank Newman, uh, after his death, his wife helped to fund. So that's the long answer to a short question about an important topic. Were you able to continue some involvement in that once you took the bench? Before I took the bench, my wife and I uh, made one last trip to Cambodia. And I, by this time, I had a whole community of friends in Cambodia, Cambodians. And uh, we interviewed 12 of them. And I had maybe 40 hours of tapes about their whole lives. The Khmer Rouge, the Vietnamese occupation, the time of UNTAC, which was the United Nations, and beyond. When I got back, I started to put together a, uh, a book of sorts. I wasn't sure what it was going to be, but I did a lot of writing. And then I was appointed to the bench. And uh, since I've retired, I've come back to it. And honestly, I've been kind of writing feverishly, writing profiles of each of the 12 that we interviewed, have the tapes, we have very good notes, I have all that I put together before. And uh, for the last four months, I've kind of been immersed in their lives. And it's reminded me of how inspiring and moving the international work that the law school did was. You know, so as I look back on a lot of things I did, it was, a lot of it was serendipity. An opportunity was there. And I think I have seized those opportunities. But a lot of it was just luck, you know, being in the right place or at a place where something came up that looked interesting. There is a, seems to be a common refrain amongst some of the very, I don't want to use the word successful necessarily, but um, people have, have made an impact. And then they oftentimes will use the, the phrase luck. And uh, I've said that, you know, chance favors the prepared, those who take the opportunity and, and do run with it. Yeah. And I think that goes back to the conversation we had earlier. It's real easy to say, if an opportunity comes up and you're passionate about it, run with it. And I like to think I did that uh, or con and continue to do it. Um, but uh, that said, there's also a reality check in all of this. And for some people, the opportunity to run with it is not necessarily there. Uh, my generation, I think, in some ways grew up in, a, in an incredible time, uh, particularly those of us that were lucky enough to be able to go to schools. And uh, the, the opportunities were there. And there, as I said before, and I don't mean to repeat it, but the opportunities are sometimes difficult, more difficult to run with than they were for me. And I know that. And again, I think I was lucky that way. But I think part of the other reason that we kind of retreat from impact, um, who knows what impact any of us make. And I, for myself, I don't like to either be self-righteous or to somehow say that I'm having an impact in ways that I may think I am, but I'm not oh. sure. So there's a modesty, and I hope it's not a false modesty about it, because I think humility is really important. I won't get the lines to Ozymandias right, but the uh, look all you upon this and weep. Yeah. On a, a plaque sitting in dust. Yeah. 
your book, is it a, a point where you have some concept as to when people should start looking for it? There's an anniversary uh, coming up, which is uh, poignant and horrifying, which is on April 17th, 1975, the Khmer Rouge um, entered Phnom Penh and evacuated the city. And it remained evacuated and empty for five years while they slaughtered two plus million of an eight million population. And the uh, uh, anniversary of that, the f- uh, 50th anniversary, is uh, April 17th, 2025. I would love to have something together. But again, uh, the stories I'm telling are not my stories. It's, it, it's, it, it, there's parallels everywhere. Uh, they're the stories of the Cambodians. And so, you know, I'm working with them to help craft the story. I'm writing the stories based on what they told me. But, you know, where it will all go is not going to be my decision. It's going to be their decision. And so, but I would love it if uh, something in 2025 could could be in the works. Will you touch on your experience with your students and in 1997 being there when there was a coup in that? Yes. Yes, definitely. Uh, and it led to other things about hope and uh, what resilience and why people remain hopeful in the face of complete devastation. Uh, and th- that will be, I hope, a focus of the book, along with the importance, and again, this gets back to what I was talking about as being a judge, the importance of the rule of law, the importance of fair rules, fair decision-making, listening to both sides, coming to a uh, determination whether you're trying to settle a case or you're trying a case where people feel heard. This is a conversation. It's not supposed to be a fight. And I know people feel inclined to fight because they're, they, they feel wronged, both sides. It is described as the adversarial process, and some people take it too seriously. Yeah, well, I don't know about taking it too seriously because, um, I don't know what, uh, I forget what the line is, but the adver- adversarial process in the courtroom, I think, can lead to some semblance of the truth better than other systems might. So I have tremendous admiration for the adversarial process. But there's got to be a point where we can help put that aside and sit down and talk in a way that people feel heard and be able to resolve whatever the dispute may be, no matter how small or how large it is. I always felt that when I was doing the small claims calendar, it was as important as the $100 million asbestos case with the horrible consequences of whatever might have happened. And I smile only because I seem to recall having heard from a small claims judge that it is the most dangerous place to rule from the bench. Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> no, they, there are its uh, competitors. I also did the um, civil harassment calendar. That's a very depressing calendar. People really are at each other's throats. Yeah. The elder abuse calendar is another one. Um, but this is, these are important calendars. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's why being a judge was wonderful and also a real challenge. I'm going to to have a very clumsy segue, but I, I, I want to lighten it for a, a moment or two. How did it come to pass that you became a managing partner, not of a law firm, but of a, a ball team? First of all, I uh, uh, grew up loving baseball. I came from Brooklyn. Uh, we moved to California in 1956. My father was convinced, or 1954, my father was convinced that when the Dodgers moved from Brooklyn to Los Angeles, they moved because he had moved. 
And so I grew up loving the game and uh, uh, remained a fan uh, for forever. A Dodgers fan? Uh, no. Okay. I just... No. And, knowing and that's where we a, are. That's an important question. Okay. And there will... Uh, uh, I completely switched allegiances, although some of my friends tease me that I never changed allegiances, but I assure you I did. And actually became uh, more of an Ace fan than a Giants fan. Um, but now uh, 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 the Giants and the A's are uh, teams that I follow probably too much. But in any event, um, this was in 1985 to 89. Uh, it, 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 minor league teams were available for almost nothing. So I, t I said to a friend of mine, let's go to the major league meetings. This was in Los Angeles in 19, I think it was 89. I said, let's go down there and just see if we can find a team. These guys, I mean, it'd, it'd just be fun. And sure enough, we ended up uh, buying, uh, investing in an ongoing partnership that at the time owned the Reno Silver Sox which was an independent team at the time. We later became a minor league uh, 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 partner of the A's and then ultimately the Seattle Mariners. Um, so that's how we did it. It was my love of the game. And again, just because I thought it would be fun. And it was fun. Although it turns out just, to, and I, uh, I'll keep this short, that owning a minor league team has precious little to do with baseball, okay? <laughs> trust me on this. No major league team is going to trust their talent, even in the early 90s, to two guys from Berkeley who decide they want to run a minor league baseball team. So really, it was more about like uh, uh, running a movie theater. Okay. Oh, uh, the major league team would use the facilities and supply the coaches and make all the decisions. And we had, you know, sold popcorn and Cokes and hot <laughs> dogs and had stupid contests like the dirtiest car in the parking lot or that kind of thing. But we had a great time and did interact with a lot of the baseball people who actually were very nice, very smart people uh, at the time. It feels very old-timey and bulldormish in certain ways and it was yeah it kind of was and of course that you know where that's all gone now is a whole other discussion also on on the lighter side uh, uh my understanding is you had some involvement in announcing cal football i did i did this is kind of embarrassing but uh, uh when i was a freshman at when i first came to california i didn't know anybody obviously i mean i was 10 uh and uh I used to sit on the curb in the San Fernando Valley and make up baseball games, pretend I was announcing them. So anyway, then I, you know, played baseball some and became passionate uh, about the sport and uh, went to Cal. And I guess I must have done something similar because at some, some point, this was when KALX was KAL. We had a listenership of, I don't know, 100 people. Uh, it, it, it was the radio station that at the time went to the dorms. And uh, so the guy came up to me and said, you know, rather than talking about baseball games in the hallways, would you be interested in doing it on the radio? And I said, sure. So um, we ended up, myself and uh, a dear friend, Henry Weinstein, who's a was the labor of, uh, reporter for the L.A. Times for decades now, a professor at UC Irvine Law School. Uh, he and I and another friend, uh, John Simmons, uh, the three of us, all who had come from the San Fernando Valley, ended up broadcasting football, baseball, mm -hmm. and we tried to do the basketball games. That is impossible. But Too fast? Way too fast. But the baseball games were fun. The football games were kind of the premier thing that we did. Ultimately, KLX became a serious radio station, which it is to this day. And uh, 
Of course, the whole field of announcing has changed dramatically. But we did have a booth next to KSFO uh, at Memorial Stadium. And uh, Bud Foster, who was the announcer for the Cal games at the time, tried to get us kicked off the air because he thought we were competing with him. Interesting. I mean, that was a joke. I mean, we, we had no listeners as near as I could tell. Mm. Uh, but it but it was a lot of fun, and uh, it was always the same opening. And what was that? It's cool, clear, and crisp, and a great day for football. Jeff Brand, KAL Sports, the stadium. It didn't matter what the weather was. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of fun with it. Nice. As we come into our home stretch, is, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you feel is important for our listeners to know? I guess uh, what I would come back to is the uh, importance and responsibility and privilege of being involved in the trial and lawyering process. Great lawyers are an inspiration and they're critical to making sure society functions in ways that we want. Judges who can set aside their personal views and really, as flawed as the system often is, really try and seek the truth and apply the law as it is presented. The importance of that cannot be overstated. And um, I just feel lucky to have been able to be involved in all of this in so many different roles for as long as I have. Well, as somebody who was a, a direct beneficiary of being in your class and who has a number of lawyers who I've, I've worked with over the years who've come out of the USF system, um, I, I'm very appreciative for your dedication to the craft. Thank you, Miles, and it was uh, this was a pleasure too. Well, thank you, thank you for taking the time. You're welcome, and thank you for listening today. Please email us at podcast at cooperstatlaw with questions, comments, feedback, and suggestions. Like what you heard, share us with a colleague, and leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. To all of you doing justice out there, happy hunting.